Um, if you have your Bibles or your apps, whatever you use for your Bible for the Word, uh, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 this morning. This was at one time, I guess you could still call it that, though uh, I probably have several of them nowadays, but um, this is one time what I call my life verse. Anybody have a life verse? You know what a life verse is? It's kind of your uh, your passage that kind of jumped out at you at one time or another, and you've kind of taken ownership over it. Um, this was mine, uh, 2003-ish, 4-ish. Um, I was saved as a boy, but my life was really transformed in, in 2004. Uh, and a short time after that, I was reading through the Bible, through the New Testament at that time, and uh, got to 2 Corinthians. I mean, this is all like fresh to me, like first time reading a lot of these books. And I got to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And man, that just jumped off the pages of Scripture for me because I had had a new birth, you know, and uh, maybe I was saved as a boy, but um, something something clicked with me in 2004. Something something changed um, in me, and for the first time when I read this, I was like, "Wow, that is like that's defining me. That's that's what's going on inside of me. And I feel like a, I feel like a new creation." And uh, we're actually going to be digging into that not only this week, but for several. Several messages to come. Luke uh, will be uh, preaching here and there about once a month. But um, when uh, when I'm bringing the message, we're going to be looking at this new creation series. All right, let's look at Second Corinthians five, starting in seventeen. Um, the context here is Apostle Paul is saying that Christ died for all, and therefore those who are are being raised to life spiritually, he doesn't, he doesn't look at them the same way. We're, we're, new, we're new creations, and that's where he says right here. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Jesus Christ, that means um, you're following Christ, you're looking to Christ. Anybody who looks to Christ, anybody who trusts in Jesus, that's, that's, that's faith, that's, that's believing upon uh, Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Um, not will be a new creation, but is a new new creation. The old has passed away. Jesus talks about this. It's called being born again in, in John, um, John chapter 3. Um, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all of this is from God, who through Jesus Christ reconciled us to himself. That means... In order to be reconciled, you have to be lost or wayward. You know, he has brought us uh, back to himself, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Um, I've got a little, Joseph's not back there. I've got a little echo. I don't know if that's something we can change. If not, it'll be all right. All this is from God, who through Jesus Christ has reconciled us to himself and has not only reconciled us, but given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now that we've been reconciled to God, right? Uh, the peace between us and God has happened. We've become children of God. Now we're supposed to, we have this, this purpose, this vocation, this ministry of being ministers of reconciliation. All of us. This isn't just Paul. He is talking about him and the apostles, but that's passed on to everybody who who is reconciled to Christ, they've been given the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, in Jesus, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent Jesus, just like somebody would a nation. We represent Jesus God making his appeal through us. And so Paul says to the church, we implore you on behalf of Jesus Christ, be reconciled to God. I think it's interesting too, he's preaching to Christians, not just unbelievers. Be reconciled to God. So this morning, I want to look at 
look a uh, closer look at, at what this passage means. What what does it mean to be a new creation? What does it mean that we're a new creation? And what does it mean to be reconciled to God? And so there's some interesting, peculiar things that we've seen in the last few weeks as we ended our Revelation series. We got to Revelation chapters 19, 20, and, and 21 especially. Um, we see in Revelation 21, God sitting on his throne at the end of all things, at the beginning of new creation, right? The new heavens and the new earth. We see God on his throne. His dwelling place is now with mankind. And he says, behold, I am making, I-N-G, I am making all things new. And then we also saw Jesus back in Matthew 19, uh, 28. He alludes to the renewal of all things, that there would be a time of renewal of all things. That, that word uh, renewal of all things, is, in some translations, it's, it's translated regeneration. That means it's being made new. Something is, is being uh, rebirthed, renewed. Um, and so he talks about a time when all things will be renewed. And so that is, in part, what it means to be reconciled and, and made new. But unfortunately, that's a foreign concept to what some of us have been taught in the church. And, and it matters. It matters. Uh, it affects our values. And I've found that it affects our, our, our theology, affects our lives. The way, the way we see what God is doing in the world, right? It, it affects how we live in the here and now. And so what I want us to see this morning is that God's main objective is not to get you into heaven. And so that's, that's what we've been, uh, you know, some of us have been taught is God's main objective is to get into heaven. What I want to propose is that God's main objective is to get heaven into you. That's what God is doing in the world. And so if you go to that next slide there, there's a whole realm of, of Christianity that just doesn't get it. And, and, and it shows. And it goes like this. Jesus is a Savior, uh, which we recognize, who takes believers to heaven when they die. And that's truth, right? Uh, that, that sounds familiar. That sounds right. And, and, and it is right in part. But the problem is that, the, is that the, 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 the buck pretty much stops right there. And so the results are at best is, uh, you know, people... Passing out tickets, you know, plane tickets, bus tickets, train tickets, whatever, however we get to heaven, you know, passing out those tickets, you know, uh, if you were to die today, for instance, you know, do you know where you might go? And none of that is, 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 is bad necessarily, but the problem is, is that it falls short of the ministry of reconciliation. What it ends up being is more of a project-based love. We're just trying to, we're, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's a type of great commission where God has sent us to just get as many people, get their ticket to heaven as, as possible. It's to create converts, uh, not, not, not disciples. And sometimes it's, it's, it's out of a fear-based love, right? It's, it's, none of us wants our loved ones to die and not go to heaven, right? We don't want them to go to hell, right? And that's a good thing. We should have that kind of passion for our loved ones. But again, it falls short of our purpose here on the earth. And so in this type of, uh, of, of Christian religion, we may have a religious uh, rule book. Uh, we may have a type of morality, but it's really based on just because God says so. We don't really see the purpose of following God, being obedient to Jesus. And so that's at best. At worst, at worst and there's no good about this, is we, we only worship God as a ticket. He's our fire insurance. He keeps us out of hell and He gets us to heaven. It's, and that really is a fear-based love. It's not a true love of God. It's not a true love of, of, of humanity, of other people. It's we don't want to go to hell and so therefore we have prayed this prayer so that we can be a part of Jesus' club. And so now we've got our ticket, our plane ticket, and we're, we're just sitting and we're, we're waiting and we're not fulfilling our purpose here on the earth. That sound familiar? It's a decision-based faith, and granted, uh, our faith is decision-based. At one point, you had to pass from darkness to light. You had to give uh, your life to 
to Jesus Christ, you had to become a new creation, right? You're not born a, a new creation. You're not born with a, a new birth. You're, you have a physical birth, and then you must be reborn. You must be made new. But this type of decision-based faith has no change in identity. And it doesn't see the big picture. One can be greedy. One can be hateful. One can be unforgiving, violent, selfish, racist, and still claim Jesus as Lord and Savior. I want to propose to you that's not the gospel. So what is Christianity really all about? You can go to the next slide. What is Christianity really all about? It's about God renewing a creation that has been destroyed by sin. Behold, I am making all things new. That's the renewal. That's the regeneration. He's making all things new. He's renewing a creation. Not just us, but He's renewing a creation. He will renew a creation that has been destroyed by sin. And that new creation began at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know about you, but I know in my personal experience, there was one time I didn't, I didn't understand the resurrection. I just thought it was an after effect of the cross. We, we can't leave Jesus dead, so he's got to be raised from, from the grave. And that was the end of my understanding of my theology of what, what, what Jesus did on our behalf. But it's all about the resurrection. Jesus died and he, he raised again because He is the beginning of new creation. He was the beginning of, of, of the new. New creation began at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's what the Bible calls the first fruits. And new creation culminates with a new heavens and new earth. When the, Not just this earth, but this whole, whole cosmos. I just smile thinking about what that might in, entail. We think about space exploration. It's not just the new, uh, new earth. What does that mean for the rest of this, you know, this vast cosmos? What is God going to do? It's exciting times, but that's when new creation uh, culminates, right? When there is no more tears, no more crying, no more disease, no more pain, no more, no more sorrow. The dwelling place of God will be with man in his Fullness. But right now, in the meantime, Jesus is renewing hearts and minds through the gospel. That is through the forgiveness of sins. Uh, that's being set free from shame. That's from Romans 8.1. You know, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He wants to separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. And if you are in Christ this morning, your sins are are. No more as far as God is concerned. They've been forgiven. There's freedom in that, right? That's why I prayed this morning for us to understand our freedom in, in Christ so that we can be stretched. Because it's a lot easier to be stretched when you don't see a threat. You know what I'm saying? saying? It's a lot easier to feel that, that, that pain of God's surgery on our hearts when we don't feel a threat. And I want to tell you, if you're in Christ, there is no condemnation that's been forgiven that's what the cross was about. That's what receiving Jesus is about. And it doesn't just stop there. As He renews our hearts and mind, He has given us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He came to take up residence in us and give us new life. That's the key word, new life. If you're in Christ this morning, you have new life. Maybe you haven't experienced it up to this point. I don't know but you have been given new life. I want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus is making you new? I shared this a couple weeks ago. Steve Gregg says, the Christian is not simply given a ticket to heaven and a new set of re uh, religious rituals, but every, listen to this, every area of his or her life is targeted for renewal as a result of his participation in the new life. If you're in Christ, you have participated in the new life. You're in the new life. And so what does that mean? Every area of your life, every big and small, those things that you're still hiding from God, all of that is targeted for renewal because he wants to make you whole. He wants to make you new. All of that. 
And so that's what I want to look at not only now, but in the next several weeks is, is for us to be open for God to do that and allow Him to do that in our lives because He wants to bring healing to you. That's what the gospel is all about. Renewal and reconciliation. So let's take a look at Genesis chapter 1. Let's take a look at your, your uh, what I call your factory settings. Your factory default. <laughs> How you were made initially. Genesis 1.27 So God created man in his own image. We're created in the image of God. We're made to, to image, to be image bearers, to reflect God. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So he's not just talking about a male, he's talking about mankind. Male and female, he created them in his own image. So all of us, whether you whether you believe most people, not all are believers in this room, but whether you're a believer or unbeliever, Unbelievers out there in Old Town Spring or wherever, they are made in the image of God. Adolf Hitler was made in the image of God. We are all made in the image of God. It's been distorted by sin. It's been broken by sin. But we're made in the image of God. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So let's break this down. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Ephesians uh, 5.1, Apostle Paul says, Be imitators of God as beloved children. That's what it means to image God. Did you know that? We're already made in His image, but to, to image Him is to be imitators of God. Not in His uh, not as in his divine attributes. None of us are omnipresent. We can't be everywhere at once. You know, none, none of us are omniscient. We don't, I can't read Joe's mind. You know, I don't know what's going on in there. That's one of the reasons we don't judge, right? Is because we don't know somebody's hearts and their, uh, we don't know their intent, right? Those are things that only God knows. I can't operate in that fashion. That's not what it means. But those, those attributes, that we'll get to in a moment, uh, we reflect God in that way. Be imitators of God's character. That's what it means. As beloved children. King Solomon. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. He kind of goes through, he's, he's experienced everything in life. He's experienced power and riches and, and just following after his, his passions and, and, and kind of that pursuit of happiness type of thing, right? And And it's actually a very pessimistic book in in a lot of ways. You know, he keeps coming to the conclusion it's all vanity. It all means, it's all meaningless. It all means nothing. If you don't have God, if God isn't the center. And at the end of of the book, in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he says, "This, this is the end of the matter. This is the conclusion I've come to. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You'll get that. This is the whole duty of man. Keep his commandments. I've I've said this before. The commandments are not all about this thing is, what is that, icing? Sorry, y'all know I'm obsessive compulsive. uh, Catching that thing out of the corner of my eye. Sorry, I had to stamp it out. Now I'm okay. If I don't slip on myself. Uh, where was I? Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen. Uh, fear God and keep His commandments. Uh, remember, the commandments aren't about rules and regulation. It's the wisdom of God. It's the love of God. It's the way that we operate in what y'all heard me say is wholeness in this world. It's the way that we're fully human because we were made to dwell with God, Right? Adam and Eve at the beginning, that's, they were there with God in their midst, and they, did, they, functioned, they functioned with God through God. Their eyes were always, you know, spiritual eyes always were on God, and they operated that way. That's the way that we're made, we're made to, to, uh, to function. And so the, the, the commandments um, are all about God's heart and character and His wisdom. It's the way that we love God and love people. Go back and look at them. 
<laughs> it's all about loving God and loving people. That's what the, the commandments are, are all about. Well, some of you, like, well, we're New Testament Christians, you know. We're not, we're not under the law anymore because Jesus fulfilled the law. Yeah, so that means follow Jesus and obey Jesus. It's all wrapped up in Him. All that Old Testament stuff is wrapped up in Jesus, so, so follow, follow Jesus, obey Jesus, listen to Jesus, because He is the way of wisdom. He is the way of love, right? He is the, he is the exact imprint of God's character. And so we follow Jesus. Micah 6, eight, God has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So to exhibit the attributes of God is how we image God. But our default settings also says be fruitful. It says the word to be fruitful. What does that mean? It means that we are to be productive on this earth. Not just in heaven, we are to be productive on on, on this earth. That's something else that I didn't get. I didn't get why. I mean, I knew that we were supposed to do good in the world, you know, and get jobs to support our families, you know. I, but I always saw that as like uh, what we call like tent making. That was just something just to pay the bills, right? But that's not the way the Bible explains. We're to be, we're to be productive in this world to the glory of of God, 1 Corinthians 10.31, so what, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Can you do everything that you do to the glory of God? Do you pursue to do everything you do to the glory of God? Because if you do, you'll, you'll, have, to, you'll have to have a reflective prayer life. Somebody the other day, this isn't in my notes, somebody the other day, I was on Twitter, you know, sometimes in... in, in we're trying to protect the faith, right? We're in, in apologetics. We're trying to protect the faith. We're trying to keep all the false theology out and the good theology in. And sometimes people just get so messed up because they make assumptions about things. And, and people were complaining about, well, contemplative prayer is not of God. You know, that's Eastern religion, you know? And just because something or a form of it exists in Eastern religion, God wants us to contemplate. He wants us to reflect. He, he wants us to listen, not just... Uh, speak. My answer to that was like, do you think when Jesus spent all night praying to God, he was doing all the talking? We have to stop and listen and, and reflect and let God speak to us. Let his Holy Spirit speak to us. My goodness, we need that in our culture. But if you're going to do whatever you do to the glory of God, we have to have a reflective life, right? We have to think about our decisions. But outside of that, everything that you do outside of sin can be done to the glory of God. You can work to the glory of God. You can play to the glory of God. All that is what it means to worship God. And we were called to be productive, to be fruitful on this earth because this earth was made for man and man made for this earth. I'll repeat what I said a couple weeks ago. We see, well, we're not supposed to be of this world. We're not supposed to be under the pattern of this world. But this earth is our home in the sense that planet earth was made for mankind. And in the end, this planet is, is resurrected. It's renewed, just like, just like Jesus. There's a new heavens and a new earth. It's not an escape plan that God is carrying out throughout the scriptures. That's not what the story is about. That would say God failed. It's to make all things new. That's what God is doing. Be fruitful and multiply. So we see reproduction, uh, physical multiplication, and there's debate, you know, these days on, you know, have, have we already accomplished that because we've spread over the earth and other people are like, no, we need to keep being fruitful and we should all have kids and that's open for debate, physical uh, reproduction. But what I want to point out in the New Testament, this mirrors, this, this physical reproduction mirrors a spiritual uh, reproduction. Uh, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the Great Commission. Jesus, right before uh, he ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Make followers of me of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. You see that? 
This is what King Solomon said, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. So we're supposed to reproduce spiritually. That's what the Great Commission is all about, right? We're supposed to spread. We've been reborn. Now we're supposed to spread that new birth to the world because that's the ministry of reconciliation. God is renewing all things, and we get to be a part of that. We've been given that ministry. It's beautiful. He said, subdue, subdue this earth and have dominion over this earth. That means we're to rule over this earth. This earth was given for us not to rule. I mean, there's a very much a corrupt way of ruling over this planet, and we see that in mankind. That's part of the, the brokenness and sin in this world. But that doesn't mean we weren't made to rule over this earth. We were made to rule, to cultivate this earth, and to steward this earth. In the new heavens and new earth, we see a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And I, again, I get it that a lot of that is, is symbolic. It's talking about the church. But it's, it's talking about it in, in, in terms of a city. You know? And so we were made, you know, man-made things themselves aren't, aren't evil. It's when it's distorted, right? And so there's cities. We are to cultivate and build cities and do those types of things. But we're not to do it for our own glory. We're to do it for the glory of God. And so science, music, art, all that stuff is a part of, of subduing this earth, of using its resources. I was thinking the other week, it was so cool, I was thinking about music. I think I shared that maybe with Joseph, but um, music was, it wasn't like God formed Adam and Eve and it was like music was already here. At some point, people had to go and like discover that two beats go together, two different types of beats, right? And, and music, for lack of a better term, you know, please forgive me, it evolved, it it. it, it it grew into what we have now. And so the sciences, all those things are, are like Easter eggs that God has, has put in this world for man to go and cultivate and to discover as we subdue and have dominion over this earth. That is your factory settings. We were made in the image of God and we were given a, a job to do, to go fill this earth and work to the glory of God, to cultivate it to the glory of God. And that would be our act of worship. Go to the next slide. But what God is doing now is, um, actually, no, that was the slide before was the slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, what God is doing now is he is restoring your factory default. He's, he's, he's resetting you back to your default. It's been corrupted by sin. That's what the gospel is all, all about. Through the forgiveness of sins, he is reconciling people back to them by the giving of the Holy Spirit. He is giving them new life and reconciling people back to God. We are being restored back to our factory default. Ephesians 2.10, now you can go, for we are his workmanship. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You know that? You were created for good works. You were created to do good things, to be his image bearers, which God prepared beforehand. That means he already had prepared it. That was already your vocation. That was already your purpose. God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What does that mean? It's things like justice and mercy and compassion and forgiveness and generosity to be a general blessing in the world. We were created for those things. And he he. he, he he prepared those things beforehand for human beings to walk in. And when we're in Christ, our factory settings are being restored so that we can walk in those things. John 15, 16, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit shall abide. What does he mean by fruit? He tells us in Galatians. Things like love, joy, these are the fruits of the Spirit. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, things like that. Those are the things that you and I were made for. We were made to bear, bear fruit. Then in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, God says that... Uh, or not God, sorry, the Apostle Paul, rather, not God, uh, says be imitators of God, right? We just read that a little bit ago, but I want to expand on it. Be imitators of God as, as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 
So what I want you to see here is in God's kingdom, your factory settings are being restored, right? So he says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Why? Because he's reset the iPhone. <laughs> he's, he's resetting. He's restoring you. He's, you've been given the Holy Spirit. You've been given a, a, a new birth. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk nor crude joking, which are all out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. This is who you are. This is who I created you to be. This is who I'm restoring you to be. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. But that's not you, is it? That's not you. So put those things away. Like an old coat, put it away. That doesn't belong to you anymore. That's not your identity. God has a purpose for you to live out in this world now, not sitting with our ticket, waiting for heaven to come, now, in the here and now. And so the kicker is renewal and reconciliation is not just something that has already happened. It is happening, I-N-G. It is happening. And so simple decision-based Christianity falls absolutely flat right there. Jesus is Savior and He's nothing more. He's our ticket to ride. He's not our master. We don't, we don't follow Him. We certainly don't listen to Him. And of course, some only give thanks for their ticket on Easter and Christmas. We have that brand of Christianity. Of course, some people sit in church every week with this brand of, of Christianity because their identity is with their church attendance. We don't teach others to be His disciples. We may teach others if we're zealous we may, we may go get, gather converts, but we're not teaching people to follow Jesus, right? And to obey Jesus. And we may or may not have rules to live by. Some Christians are moral. Some Christians are not very moral. But what isn't happening in both cases, if it's this type of decision-based Christianity, what isn't happening is personal renewal. We cannot be what God has created us to be. What is that? Ambassadors for Jesus? Representers of Jesus? And ministers of reconciliation? We cannot be that if we don't allow God's ongoing renewal in our lives. Guys, I am being renewed. Those of you who know me very well, you have seen my imperfections, right? You've seen my, my ugly uh, side. I am being renewed. And it's good for us to recognize that, that we need ongoing renewal in our lives. Yes, we have already been declared new creations, but there's a renewal of the mind that has to happen in us. Babies aren't born adults. They're born infants. But here's the thing. Unlike physical birth, you know, a, a baby may continue to, to grow, actually, but if they're, if, they're, if they're not taught, if they're not nourished, They'll grow up malnourished and ignorant, right? But just like that in our spiritual birth, we can, we, can, we can be Christians for 10 years and remain infants. And infants are selfish. It's all about them. They constantly need to be fed. They can't feed themselves. They certainly aren't going out and, and fulfilling their purpose in the world. But we grow from infants to toddlers to teenagers. Boy, those teenage years, huh? To adults and then finally to parents where we're reproducing children of God. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but, by, but be transformed, rather. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You see that ongoing thing? That by testing, now this is good, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Guys, this isn't self-help. You know, I used, to, I used to like shun self-help so much to the extent, and there is a form of self-help that is not healthy. It's more self-consumed. You know what I'm saying? But here's the thing. Satan is, is he's not stupid. I think this is what he does in, in, with, with Christians, is he does stuff like that, you know, 
And, and, and so we're supposed to uh, be other-centered, right? I used, to, I used to make this, I made this t-shirt, God, others, self, and self is small, right? Because we're to put others before ourselves. All that is absolutely true, right? But what Satan does is he, he gets your focus so much on that. When you hear something about self, you're like, oh, I don't want to be selfish. And you ignore the healing that God needs to do uh, inside of you. This isn't about self-help. It's about self-renewal. It's about allowing God to renew you. It's not self-centered. I mean, there's a brand of Christianity that is, right? But what I'm, what I'm talking about this morning isn't just a Bible study and, and, and about church attendance. It's, it's being renewed. But I like what Paul says here. He says, by testing. By, by testing. we renewed by testing. Did you catch that? What does that mean? It means practice. That means practice. That means trial and error. Yeah, trial and error. What do you mean? And I said in our as we prayed this morning, I said that that we need to we need to really hold on to the fact that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That we're at total peace with God. And so that's why I, in in my home I have uh, don't don't live by perfection, live by God's grace. Because if we're, if we're fearing failure all the time, we're not going to grow. And so get out there and be image bearers of God, right? And we're going to fall. We're going to skin our knees. We get up, we confess our sins, and we keep moving. That's how you keep going. Because shame, which we're going to get to later on in this series, that's, that's when we're looking back and it's holding us back. It's holding us down. But I like that. Trial and error. Experience. And so it may get messy. It may get messy, but that's the way that we grow. Information alone does not transform. Even reading our Bibles, I know this is the Word of God, but there's unbelievers out there that know their Word. They'll argue with you about it. And there's Christians that know their Word, but they're not, they're not being renewed. They're not being, uh, being transformed. So information alone does not transform what transforms engagement. So when we engage that information, when we go out and learn to walk by faith and we put it to the test, that by testing, by testing what? You may know, you may be able to discern what is the will of God. You've got to go out and engage God's word to discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and, and perfect. It's learning to make Christ your center, and when he is, you'll be more effective than you ever could have under a simple decision-based ticket-to-ride type of gospel. Healed people heal people. That's what it's all about. That's what it is about being re renewed. It's not about being self-centered. It's about being healed because when we are healed, what I've learned is the, the more I'm healed because I've got a lot of junk that God still has got to get out of me, right? And He's still got to... He's still got to heal me in, in that process of, of making me whole. But the more areas that I'm healed in, the more I can be an agent of healing to others in the world. Otherwise, you just get in the way. You ever feel like you get in the way? I do. And there's things that I, I, I want to do, and I just keep, I, 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 I screw up in those areas. I let my own anxiety get the best of me, right? And I want to operate a certain way, and I end up being more destructive. That's okay. Just get on board with being healed, allowing God to change you. Because here's the thing. Listen to this. Your wounds don't just affect you. They affect other people. Now, I want us to stop thinking in terms of, oh, well, that's the person over there is wounded. They really need to hear this. They're causing a lot of damage, that person that gets on my nerves over there. We all have wounds, big and small, all right? Think in terms of that, we're all wounded in certain areas. But remember, God, He's, he's working on us as a whole, right? There's not, there's not areas that He's wanting us to, to hide from Him. All of that needs to, be, needs to be made whole. And so your hang-ups, and again, I'm not no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Your hang-ups, listen, think, think deep and hard about this. Your hang-ups don't just affect you, they affect other people. And if you're brave enough, go and ask other people, does this hang up affect you? And if they're honest with you, 
I would say if they love you and they're afraid you're not going to get you know, upset, it's always good to create that safe place. Say, no, I need this. I need you to speak to me in this other area. They'll, they'll share with you if they're brave enough to. We can't afford to see the gospel as just a going to heaven type of gospel where we're just sitting and waiting for our plane to arrive. Nor can we afford to see it as a one and done transformation. Again, consider yourselves new creations. Rest in the fact that that is your identity. You're in, you are a new creation, but you need to be renewed in your mind. We all do. Renewal is a process of becoming what God has created us to be. Ephesians 4.17, if you bring that up, Joseph. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. Now I now this I say and testify in the Lord, Paul says, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. You, you substitute that word Gentile with unbeliever. The context of the New Testament. Un, unbeliever. That's the way Jews looked at the Gentile world as unbelievers. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their, their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. They're alienated from the life of God. They have not received the new birth because of the ignorance that is in them. They're ignorant. Not ignorant. Ignorant. They don't know. Due to their hardness of heart. And they have a hardness of heart. So they're, they're, not, they're not seeking God. They're not following God. They're not, being, they're not being renewed because they haven't been renewed. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. But listen to Paul. But that is not the way that you learned Christ. Again, not just new birth, but the way you learned Christ. That's what we're doing right now, right? We're learning We're learning Christ. That's not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him, as the truth is in Jesus. Listen to this. To put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed, there it is, that word again, be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on your new self, created after the likeness of God. That's that default, right? That's our factory setting. We were made in the image of God in Genesis chapter 1. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That's who you are. And so when you've been redeemed by God and you've been given, you get to participate in the new life through the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of sins, He says, take off that old coat and toss it and put on righteousness. Put on your identity of who you are in Christ. Just like I said before, when you go home today, you may have to take off that old coat again. It's something that we don't just do once, we keep doing. We keep doing. And with practice, you know what happens? your default begins to reset. But if you're not practicing, you're going to continue to walk in your old ways. I mean, physically, scientifically, our brains like physically wire themselves. And so physically, not just spiritually, it has to be rewired when we practice and we walk in the faith. Our brain actually rewires itself. Did you know that? You will continue in the same habits unless you you do what God says and to practice a new way to put off your old self and to put on your new self. If you continue in the same ways, you will continue to operate in the same ways. So, for the next ten messages or so, what I would like to do is to share some some tools in this process and and some of those concepts uh, I've learned in faith walking, which... You know, if you've been here long enough, you've heard me really talk about that a, a lot. Um, and which I recommend anybody who wants to go deeper in this, I, I encourage you to to be a part of Faith Walking. It's been a blessing to me and those who who are who are taking part uh, now. There's several of us that are are going through it. If that's something you'd like to do, it's uh, there's there's courses starting at the end of January. Just ask me about them. I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. We even have scholarships um, to to give for that if if, if you need. But the next 10 messages, I want to share with you uh, some of these concepts. But, but more importantly, I want to show you that these concepts are right there in the Scriptures. 
These are things that the Holy Spirit uses to bring ongoing transformation in our lives. So I think it's going to be good stuff. We're going to end with this. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, uh, Apostle Paul says this, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good, uh, good pleasure. We're to work at it. You know, we like to think, oh no, salvation isn't of, of, of works, it's by grace through, through faith. There's a difference between earning and effort. Right? In the Christian life, there is, there is an effort it's of being obedient, of responding to the Holy Spirit, of responding to God. If we just lay there and say, God is doing the work in me, and I'm just going to be apathetic in my life, you're not going to transform. You're going you're gonna to remain an, uh, an infant. A spiritual babe. But he says, but it is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. So work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Take it seriously. That's what he means. Be sober in it. There's a disheartening observation that I have have made in, in Christian circles within the church. And that's that even some of the most zealous believers, Christians, run and hide when God pulls out the scalpel to do heart surgery. I I mean, I I know, I I get that. I understand that. Because I've got these areas that I work on and I keep returning to work on those areas. And a lot of them, God's already (laughs) worked it out in me. He's like saying, okay, now over here, Scott. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm going to keep working over here. God's saying, no, 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 we need to work on this. No, nope, that's, that's fine. Actually, God, that's, that's not a big deal. This, this, you know, this is my justification for this. We'll keep working over here. And we spend all that energy in here, but not over here because it's too painful. But God says there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You are at total peace with me. You are my child, and I love you. I love you so much. Let me heal you. I can't promise it's not going to be painful. But I promise the, 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 the abundant life that you receive from letting me, letting me heal you in this area and make you whole, it's going to be so worth it. It's going to be so worth it. That's what I want to do. Are you really comfortable with just the, uh, your ticket to heaven? Or do you want to work out your salvation and receive this ongoing healing in order that you may be agents of healing in the world? I want to be a new creation because that's who God says that I am. That's who he says you are too. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.